After a phenomenal first quarter, what does Q2 hold for equity investors? Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Boston. And I'm Alex Steele. Happy Monday. Happy, Happy Monday. long weekend, yeah, I guess. sort of. Yeah, we're back. We finally got here, right? I was waiting for the second quarter. Yeah, it's and here. Womp womp. That's yeah. pretty much my takeaway and so that's far. no April Fool's. I, it is no April Fool's. Okay, let's take a look at where we are here. The S&P is down three-tenths of one percent, but remember, volume is light, and we just got off a great, great quarter for the equity market, where we saw stocks rally about 10%. Uh, Ten-year yield, though, honestly, is where a lot of the action is. Yields really pushing higher by 12 basis points after we got... Uh, that better than expected ISM manufacturing data, but more on that in just a second. And obviously, as you get higher yields, you get that stronger dollar, outperforming all its G10 currencies. And gold also at a record high up four tenths of 1%. That's a head scratcher, though, because if it's higher for longer, why is gold outperforming? We'll talk about that. Remain? Yeah, a lot to talk about today here on the first trading day of the new quarter. The S&P 500 coming off, well, a 10% run in the first quarter. But you got this soft start today here, a dip below a key technical support level. That was right around 52.44. You take a look at where the S&P is right now. Now, put that against the backdrop of five straight monthly gains. That still goes down as a feat only accomplished one other time this century. And it's a feat that historically underpins further gains. Jeffrey Hirsch, he's the editor over at the Stock Traders Almanac, he says that going back to 1950, when the S&P posts a consecutive monthly advance from November to March, it rises the remaining nine months of the year with an average gain of 12%. That's history. Doesn't always repeat. And getting that extra 12%, at least by evidence in today's price action, may be less linear than some investors want. In fact, they're still trying to reconcile some of those already high valuations, including the equal weighted version of the S&P 500, which is now topping 17 times earnings. That actually ranks it in the 92nd percentile of observations going back to 1985. But Goldman Sachs strategists find that historically that has been caused not for any imminent concern, saying that periods of overvaluation often persist for nearly a year and are typically benign if the subsequent economic growth environment is healthy. That's going to get us to that manufacturing data in a second. But keep an eye on sentiment as well. Scott Croner and his team of strategists, this over at Citigroup, they say the S&P is already above uh, their end-year target of 5,100 by about 3%. And they say that their own internal gauge of investor sentiment that has actually reached a, quote, euphoria level that aligns with the lower probability of positive returns over the coming year. Kroner, though, says a catalyst may still be needed to slow those gains, adding Alex that exhaustion, that's not going to be the excuse. You need something a little bit more than that. Then on the flip side, you get that data that we got today from the ISM, right? That's not going to trigger exhaustion, right? No. That's not going to trigger that sell impetus. And here's sort of the chart that shows you. So this top line here is the ISM manufacturing index, and you can really see hitting an expansion territory for the first time uh, since September of 2022. The bottom line here, though, is the warning shot, and as price is paid, you can also see uh, prices paid accelerating. On the flip side, uh, employment was a little bit weaker as well. I was talking to Tim Fiore of the ISM manufacturing index survey and he was saying maybe by June we'll see those layoffs kind of start to cool. If that's the case though, prices picking up, manufacturing picking up, demand holding up, new orders holding up. I mean, is the economy actually reaccelerating here at this point? Well, that seems to be the fear amongst a lot of investors right now, particularly when you look at some of the pricing for the amount of Fed rate cuts this year. Jeremy Siegel is joining us right now to give us some perspective. He's the professor emeritus of finance at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. And, Professor, this really has kind of been the parlor game now for quite some time. Whether uh, rate cuts should be factored into valuations, they have been. We're now seeing that dialed back. And when you look at the latest ISM data here, we've gone from a situation where the manufacturing services, a manufacturing area was weak, at least relative to services. Are we going to start to see a pickup in that? Are we looking at an economy that's healthier than maybe what we thought? Yes, Romain. What has amazed, I think, all economists, including the Fed and forecasters, is how strong this economy can be despite uh, very high interest rates, even relative to, to current uh, inflation. There is a lot of momentum there in this economy. Uh, we saw the uh, Atlanta Fed raise its uh, GDP estimate for the first quarter to, to well over 2%. Um, uh, and, and this strength is is what brought those bond yields up by uh, 12 basis points. I was a little puzzled last week why it was mm -hmm. falling because I didn't really see any weakness. 
probably uh, end of quarter uh, uh, adjustments, but 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 certainly um, the strength in the economy is going to lead to these firm rates, and we know that stock prices get discounted at interest rates, and um, so that will give some headwind to stock prices. Notwithstanding, uh, the momentum is so strong in this market. I don't think it's over. I don't think this bull run is over. I think that uh, we have more to go. And that's been the, what a lot of people have said here, Jeremy. Even when you look at valuations on a historical basis, whether it's the traditional metrics or you use CAPE or anything else here, there's an argument to be made that pockets of this market are overvalued. But is the entirety of this market overvalued? No. I mean, you know, we, we look at uh, the Magnificent Seven or you call it the Fabulous Four or just the, the tech sector. We see 25 to 30 times earnings. You just take out this tech sector. No man, there's 10 other sectors outside of tech. And they're more like 17 times forward earnings, which is an extremely reasonable uh, you know, level of valuation and uh, pretty much on par with historical averages. So, uh, yeah, when you say about pockets of, of reasonable and even low valuations, as we know, once we get to the mid cap and the small stock, uh, small stocks, we're talking about, uh, you know, the mid teens and and even the low teens mm -hmm. and many of those averages. So if we broaden out over here, we, we still could have a lot of ways to go in a lot of these stocks. So uh, I love that you brought that up, Professor. Do we see the money, say, go out of tech into the value plays like you were just talking about, small caps, mid caps? Or is this new money coming in and we're going to see really a broader base rally? I hope we see a broader base value. The truth is we've had a lot of head fakes, I hear, where all of a sudden value does extremely well. The Mag 7 back off and everyone says this is the start of something. And then a few days later, the Mag 7 or its uh, you know f f followers just reassert it, its its pull. And, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is that uh, the global growth of those stocks and the earnings growth of those stocks, probably certainly Tesla has having its own problems here, mm -hmm. uh, are so strong that I'm not surprised to see the momentum there. I, I think the momentum will stay in those stocks and broaden out. Um, one thing we have to remember, bull runs don't end at fair valuation. Mm -hmm. They often go too far before they back off. So arguing that this market is fully valued or even by some men, maybe even slightly overvalued, is certainly no argument that says that this uh, bull trend and run is soon to stop. It's such a great perspective. Um, then pivot to gold for a second, because I just don't get it. Gold at a record high, but we're looking for higher for longer from the Fed, and tech continues to outperform on a relative basis. What is up with that? Well, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. I, I remember I was, I was pretty positive towards gold, right after the pandemic when I saw money supply expanding and inflation, and it just languished for so long. And what did everyone go into? Bitcoin. Uh, and then I sort of concluded that, you know, Bitcoin is the millennials gold. They don't care about gold. It's going to languish. But the truth of the matter is gold has a 5,000 year history of value and it's going to rise with prices. It's going to rise with inflation. So what I think you have is really a catch up from a lagging early performance uh, in this inflationary cycle uh, to catch up to other commodities and other prices. When you look at some of the other commodities out there, uh, Professor, uh, particularly the ones that traditionally have been associated with economic cycles here, are we still seeing those same correlations? Can equity investors still sort of be dependent on some of the signals coming out of that space? Well, I look at I look sensitive commodity prices and I mean, your Bloomberg commodity uh, price index is, is on my, uh, you know, home screen. Uh, uh, I, it's a very sensitive indicator to not only inflationary trends, but also real strength in the world economy. And as we know, that had been in a downtrend uh, for uh, almost a year and uh, about three or four months ago broke the, the, the downtrend, stabilized, and is now moving up. Now, I'm not saying it's a threat. You know, I don't see an inflationary flare here or anything like that. But we do have to acknowledge that the commodity prices which, uh, you know, peaked out after the Russian 
invasion of Ukraine and had been going down for almost two years has broken out from its downturn and has turned upward. I think it's a strength of the economy just as much as it is any inflationary pressures. All right. Well said, uh, Professor. Always wonderful to get your perspective. Professor Jeremy Siegel there over at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, helping us to kick off uh, you to the close here on this Monday afternoon. Coming up, a closer look here at a big story that just crossed the Bloomberg terminal on Tiger Global, closing 63 uh, percent below target on its latest venture capital fund. We're going to discuss the future of that fund coming up in just a second. All right, plus the global market outlook with Jatanya Kandahi from Morgan Stanley Investment Management. And as we start off the second quarter here, more perspective here on the path ahead for U.S. equities. Jay Woods, chief global strategist at Freedom Capital Markets, going to be joining us in a bit as we count down to those closing bells. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Global Management VC fund backing enterprise tech startups has fallen real short of its $6 billion target. Joining us now for more details is Hema Parmar, uh, Bloomberg News hedge fund reporter. Uh, what does below target actually mean here? So they raised $2.2 billion for their latest venture fund. Keep in mind, it's a very difficult fundraising environment, and this fund has been very slow to attract capital. But what's interesting is that this really is uh, a sharp pivot from the funds that we've seen Tiger Global raise over the years. Their last one was nearly $13 billion big. Their each subsequent fund over over the past few years has been bigger and bigger than the one before. So this is a very um, small raise compared to what they're known for. Uh, so I'm curious, is this something that's specific to Tiger Global or are we going to see some of their other peers also see some of the same issues in trying to raise this kind of money? Yes, it's a very, very challenging yeah. fundraising environment for venture. So you've seen some firms already miss their targets. It's not uncommon in this environment to struggle to raise money for an asset class that has seen steep markdowns, that has seen um, a lot of trouble with investors having money to invest. Private equity has been slow to give distributions and so that's limiting the amount of money that some of these allocators have to okay. invest as well too. So what does it wind up meaning then for Tiger? Right. So Tiger Global, this has been a firm that's been very fast and furious when it comes to investing in venture. For years, they were putting hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars to work, um, investing in uh, hundreds of startups a year. They were one of the most frequent investors. Now what we're seeing is something of a pivot, where this is a very small fund um, in a challenging environment, as the firm has seen a lot of steep markdowns themselves. Um, and so they may take a little longer to put the money to work. Um, Already you've seen a slowdown in the pace of investments from firms like Tiger Global. It's just been trickier. Yeah, so, I mean, is a bloom off the rose for all these folks? I mean, I know we talk about Tiger Global and all mm -hmm. the other sort of uh, disciples of Julian Robertson and, and that. And I, I know they've all had kind of varying uh, degrees of success and, and, and hiccups here. But Tiger Global, I mean, I feel like... I've been talking to you about their troubles now for like two or three years. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's been a rough year yeah. for them. It's been a rough year for many of their peers. Um, they in particular felt pain on both the hedge fund side yeah. and on the private side. And you're seeing when it comes to these crossover funds, yeah. a lot more, I think, skepticism and cautiousness in how people look at these funds mm -hmm. because they're like, okay, well, you have private assets in a public vehicle. Um, sometimes they're commingled together. Sometimes they're not in Tiger's fund. They have Tiger's case. They've got the venture fund separate from the hedge funds. But you do see some firms where they are smushed together, essentially. So um, there are a number of challenges that come up with that. Uh -huh. And I think hedge funds going into venture has been a thing that's been really sort of capitalizing on excitement and interest yeah. for years. And I think there's some cautiousness to that now. So this would be a very silly question, but, you know, tech and AI is all the rage in the public markets. Mm -hmm. You would think that betting on smaller AI plays or startups or tech beginners kind of thing would be a good thing and provide mm -hmm. a lot of opportunity. Why is that not the case right now? Yes, so it has been for years. The big tech bubble, a lot of these companies did really well. But as we've seen interest rates rise, uh, okay. you've seen startups really struggle with their capital, with their managing of costs, with paying off debt. And not every company is a winner, right? So um, a lot of these these firms, they invest in so many companies, so many startups to sort of like, you just need a few of them to win in order to really make money. But as the pain really hit a lot of them at the same time, mm. and you're seeing the struggles 
really a, across a lot of them at the same time too. And so that's impacting a lot of the funds. All right. Well, Emma's uh, always, always over this story as well as others here, a closer look at some of the troubles uh, folks are having in raising these VC funds. The new headline uh, on the Bloomberg terminal right now involving Tiger Global, $2.2 billion raised, well short of that $6 billion uh, target. And Alex, this does raise a lot of questions about just market conditions overall. And I thought you made a good point about AI. You would think this would just be catnip for investors, but there's a lot of competition out there too. Well, I guess the point is that they did that already. Yeah. Like, like they had their moment in the sun with that and now mm. they're paying with the higher interest rates. And yeah. at least in my world with energy, I keep hearing there's such a big gap between like late stage investing and early stage investing. Yeah. And it's the middle that just gets really, really, really screwed in terms of cash. And they just yeah. can't get the money to flow in there. Yeah. And that's really impacting the distribution of funds. And it gets to the hurting mentality too. I mean, you kind of need someone to kind of break the break through the sort of the barrier to start and then eventually other investors maybe decide this is a thing. Or you just you need rates to go a lot lower. Yeah. You think that's going to happen? No, exactly. I don't. <laughs> but that's just me. All right. Uh, coming up here, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the retail space, particularly in footwear. Barclays actually expanding its footwear coverage over there and taking a bullish stance on companies like Crocs and companies like Skechers. We're going to talk to the person behind that call, Adrian Yee of Barclays, going to be joining us after the break. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls. The big movers on the back of analyst recommendations are we're going to start today with Micron. Bank of America actually lifting its price target to 144 from 120 and staying by that buy rating that it's had on the stock for months now. The firm says that Micron is poised to gain big as artificial intelligence tech relies heavily on that high bandwidth memory that the company makes. They're crowning Micron as one of their, quote, junior Samur AI. Get it? Shares up 5% here on the day. Next up, Delta flying high today. This after Morgan Stanley hiked its price target to a street high 85 bucks, up from 77 with the firm saying Delta's push into premium services will further attract long-term investors and drive the multiple higher over time. Investors seem to like what they hear. A modest bid on the day up about nine-tenths of a percent. And finally, Barclays kicking off coverage of Crocs. It's got an overweight rating on it and a 167 price target. The analysts there, led by Adrian Yee, saying that the company trades at a significant discount to its peer group and it maintains a unique product that capitalizes on personalization trends. The firm also initiating coverage on Skechers, On Holding, and Decker's Outdoor, adding that multiple brands have room to gain as the market keeps stepping higher. Shares of Crocs is up about 2% here on the day. And those are our top calls as we stick with that last one specifically on Crocs. We want to dive a little bit deeper into exactly what's behind it and exactly into what's really driving some of the interest in the footwear industry. Adrian Yee, I'm pleased to say, is joining us right now, U.S. Retail Senior Analyst at Barclays. Adrian, always great to talk to you. When I look at the call specifically on Crocs, let's just start there. Is this about valuation or is there a growth story there as well? There's a top line growth story, a recovery of inventory story, um, a margin expansion story, and then a valuation story. All right. So multiple ways to win here. Uh, so, okay, if you break that down, what's the overall call? Is it, in, in, yeah, just walk me through all of those points. Yeah. So, first of all, footwear is such a great subsegment of kind of consumer discretionary because unlike apparel, the, it's very fragmented, but outside of the top 10 branded players, it falls away. And so there's enough white space, right, within those top 10, you know, starting with Nike, Audi, and the performance footwear, um, athletic, you know, sector to lifestyle. Um, and each of these in particular, Crops has a very sort of, uh, you know, a competitive advantage and a very niche uh, marketplace that is sort of agnostic of income bracket, agnostic of demographics, and even age. Um, and, you know, a lot of what, what's happened here is people think that it's a pandemic play, and mm -hmm. it's not. They have just had mul multitudes of, of innovation and, and product pipeline coming. So, Adrian, when, when, I, when I take a look at, at, at what you did with Skechers and on holdings and, and et cetera, is that, a, is that a conversation about Nike? Like, overall, they're kind of flailing a little bit, so it's these other players, more selective players, that are going to do really well? Spot on. Um, so we have four initiations, two of which are actually athletic performance. Um, and that's where your thesis, uh, I agree with your thesis, in that some of the traditional incumbents, whether it be Nike or Adidas, um, over the past, you know, two to three years during the pandemic, have not put forth their best innovation. 
And because they're so large, right, because Nike's 35 percent of the global market share and Adidas is 22 percent of the global market share, these players that are 2 percent of the global market share can double, right? There's enough oxygen that's being given up so that these players that are at the uh, the cusp of that S-curve, right, early mass adoption, tons of runway and pretty low hanging fruit. How has the marketing changed, if at all? Because when I see some of these newer players kind of, at least in my view, kind of come out of nowhere and then end up being on the feet of seem- seemingly everyone out there, it kind of raises the question of how did they do that? And more importantly, why can't the bigger players, the Nikes and Adidas's of the world, I guess, replicate that to a certain extent or at least stave off that new, those new entrants? Yeah, I think part of it is the beauty of direct-to-consumer. So as these uh, nascent players are coming forth into the market, they're using both channels simultaneously. And if we think about the traditional you know, way of accessing the market historically, it's been wholesale and wholesale only. Hmm. And so, you know, Acrox is almost 50-50 DTC. So they can launch new products into their DTC, control the brand, showcase the innovation, and then at the same time, propel the brand and expand it through the wholesale market. And so I think that's a big part of kind of the, you know, advantages of going today versus, you know, the traditional. And then if we think about kind of the incumbents, right, they have such a whole, huge wholesale presence that when they pull back from that, it really moves the needle for them in terms of sales. I am curious. So when we look at that trend, it seems a lot of that is concentrated around athletic wear, leisure wear, I guess more casual footwear, if you will. Does something like that, do you think, translates into higher end luxury type of footwear and other types of luxury products? In terms of kind of the desirability. So in, in, terms of, the, in terms of like direct to consumer. Oh, yes. Yes. So when you are trying to create scarcity and trying to create desire, the DTC channel is absolutely the way to do it because you can't necessarily showcase just your brand in wholesale. It's going to be put up side by side with three, four, five other brands, right? So in the DTC format, you create the desire and the scarcity on your own. You showcase the best parts of your innovation, your product cycle, and then you create the brand desire. So absolutely, this is uh, the DTC strategy is absolutely something that can be controlled kind of to hire, to elevate brands into the higher luxury parts of the market. Adrian, great stuff. Super appreciate it. Thanks for jumping on with us. Adrian Yee uh, over at Barclays. I think the question, Romain, you're really getting at is, what's going to make you want to buy Crocs? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't feel like Romain is a Crocs kind of guy. No, I'm not. I, I, once no. bought a, I once bought a pair as a joke, and then I gave them to my son. They, they, this, they, I believe. Yeah, and then lost them uh, you know, and after about a week. Just because uh, Romain so, has some really knows? nice looking shoes. So if you see an errant pair of Crocs floating around the Hudson River or something, you know where it came from. Cool, cool. It's yeah. good to know that. All right, coming up, you get a check on emerging markets in the first quarter. The Nikkei just crushing it. We're going to talk to Jitanya Kandahari, uh, Deputy CIO over at Morgan Stanley. This is Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. Yes, I always forget saying that at yeah. this point in the show. Anyway, uh, you have the S&P is not doing that much today, but up 10% in the first quarter, right? Yeah. But not just the S&P, the DAX yeah. up 10% despite data that comes in Record consistently highs. weaker, right? Yeah. And the Nikkei Record up 20% yeah. in that highs. first quarter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, these are really big numbers and not necessarily just in the U.S. Absolutely. And this was a global rally. Obviously, we mm-hmm. focus so much on what's going on in the U.S., but you kind of forgot that when you look around the world, you could have gotten similar gains, in some cases, even better gains than the S&P. Right. So what do you do now uh, for yeah. the second quarter? Uh, let's get into more of the EM performance with Jitania Kandari, uh, Deputy CIO of the Solutions and Multi-Asset Group over at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Great to see you. Um, okay, so do we get to replicate these kind of gains, right? 20% for the Nikkei, for example, in the second quarter. Hmm. Uh, million dollar question. I, I do think that, you know, there will be some discerning by the markets. Uh, we're already beginning to see that in the U.S. with not all the mega sevens doing what they were doing last year. There's a lot of discerning. Even within the Japanese market, I think that uh, a lot of the uh, you know yen strong strong yen beneficiaries will be the way to go going forward. And within emerging markets, I know you're going to get to that. Uh, though ma- markets were up only about. Uh, 
China was down 2%, emerging market was up 2%, but ex-China, we still did 4.5%. Um, so still looking good from a structural perspective, mm -hmm. again, especially pockets of the emerging markets, ex-China. Uh, and, and if you look at the dispersion under the hood, uh, several markets like you know, Taiwan did uh, did 14, 15 percent. India was up 7 percent. A lot of the smaller emerging markets are seeing the light of the day now. And that's with a stronger dollar, too. And the dollar doesn't seem to be showing a lot of signs of weakness recently. So if the dollar eventually falls, I mean, we just off to the races here for EM? That is like a very direct negative correlation metric in the past. So weakening dollar definitely helps this asset class because it just enhances the liquidity in the global system, which is what is needed for this performance. And especially because in emerging markets, nearly a third of returns historically have come from currencies. Mm -hmm. So if a, a, a weak dollar really translates into that currency impact and a lot of these currencies ex china are very cheap and inexpensive so mm -hmm. i would think that that is a good that is going to be a good part of the uh, uh, of the total return story for these uh, for these countries obviously the dollar softness would certainly be an aid to that as well we mentioned china which has been on the back foot for quite some time yet you still had relatively decent performance out of some of the uh, non-China EM names, if China were to sort of make a comeback anytime soon in terms of economic growth and economic stability, does that then feed over into some of those other EM names? You know, last year too, if you look at emerging markets, mm -hmm. they did 10%. Uh, for the full year 2023, but EMX China did 20%. Mm. So yes, uh, you know, a China bounce back, in my opinion, it is going to be a tactical bounce back. Mm. I don't see China really pulling the index forward. I think the EM index in a, is in a stage of evolution. Mm -hmm. China was 43% of the index in 2020, it's 25%. Yeah. India was 8%, it's 16% in that same time period. So I think we're going to see a change in the index composition. Mm -hmm. and, and China's growth and China's uh, impact on, on EM is getting less and less significant. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, yes, uh, and, uh, China rebound will help the index at the headline level. Yeah, well, but uh, but, but I, I see a lot of promising opportunities, whether it's reform, it's commodities, yeah. it's digitization, yeah. playing in other parts of EM. Let's go to uh, the other part of the world, particularly down in South America. There's a lot going on there, including with Argentina, which is experimenting or uh, let's just say with some very uh, interesting uh, economic uh, policy programs here. Do you see opportunity there to invest? Let's say you're not already invested there. Someone's looking for maybe an entry point. Do you see an opportunity there? Yeah, we do like Mexico yeah. for the outsourcing yeah. and just the great macro situation. Mm -hmm. It's currently in Brazil, pockets of Brazil that are leveraged to the interest rate cuts. I think countries like, say, uh, Peru and Colombia are actually benefiting from a political stalemate because the governments can't really follow these radical policies because mm -hmm. of a divided Congress and inflation's coming down, mm -hmm. which really helps these, you know, some of the markets in, in, in the periphery. Argentina is a classic case of uh, uh, an emerging market with its back against the wall, and that's being seen in the likes of Kenya and Nigeria, Turkey, Egypt, where you've had a lot of fiscal profligacy that has led to uh, current account deficits, fiscal deficits, uh, a, a very expensive currency, mm -hmm. high inflation, and now the government's like trying to address that with reform, uh, with, uh, with high interest rates to kind of bring all these vulnerabilities down. So yes, there are pockets of opportunities in that down the cap curve frontier space emerging and emerging markets. All right, Jatanya, always great to talk to you. Great insights as always. Jatanya Kandari, Deputy CIO of the Solutions and Multi-Asset Group at Morgan Stanley Investment uh, Management. All right, coming up here uh, on the big program, we're going to talk a little bit about Tesla. Some worry on Wall Street right now about vehicle deliveries. We are expected to get an update uh, sometime this week uh, from the automaker. We're going to discuss after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, the talk of the town right now involves Ken Griffin, the CEO of Citadel, who just released a letter to investors his first in years. Citadel is the world's most profitable hedge fund out there, and Catherine Doherty covers it for us here 
at Bloomberg. And Catherine, you've had a chance to take a look at this letter. We don't hear from Ken Griffin much in this format. What did he have to say? No. Um, you do expect some of the CEOs of the largest banks and the largest hedge funds to come forward. But Griffin, it's been years since we've heard from him in this way. So he's citing economic growth in upcoming quarters. He's expecting modest growth. Um, but he's also citing the U.S. national debt as a area of concern. He's mm -hmm. saying it's a growing concern that cannot be overlooked. And he's really emphasizing here, we, we have a lot of especially Republicans that will come out and, and reference the U.S. debt as an issue. Um, but this is, he spends a whole section just going into, he calls it um, irresponsible for the U.S. government, this is a quote from the letter, to incur a deficit of 6.4 percent when unemployment is hovering around 3.75 percent. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he really, I think, just given the amount of time he's, he spends on yeah. that topic of debt shows where his priorities are. Well, what else stood out to you in the it, letter? You know what also stood out to me is his emphasis on talent. He goes into a lot of detail talking about the hundreds and thousands of applicants that both Citadel, the hedge fund, and Citadel Security, the market maker, are getting. And he's saying that they're accepting 1% or less than that. Um, and that talent is a key uh, for their success. He's talking about their year ahead. He's saying that they don't take it lightly, that their track record has, uh, they work hard for it. And he is saying that it's the talent that is the reason for their ability to, to move forward and grow in that way. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right. So talent and public uh, deficit, not good. Okay, Catherine, thanks a lot. We know you're busy. Uh, thanks for stopping by uh, to share that with us, Catherine Doherty of Bloomberg. And it's time now for the stock of the hour. And today we're looking at Tesla. Uh, the EV giant may be headed for a gloomy milestone as waning demand for electric vehicles and elevated interest rates take a toll on sales. Bloomberg's own Ed Ludlow actually just leased a Model Y himself. Hey, now. He joins us more to talk about all of this. And this comes, we're supposed to get delivery uh, um, estimates tomorrow, right? Right. And, there's a po and analysts are real worried they're going to be weak. How did you feel about the model? Why? I, I, the why? I did it because I need a new car. Our household need a new car. But this is classic Tesla that in the last three days of the quarter, the, in the U.S. at least, incentives and price cuts on offer were ridiculous, frankly, on top of the federal tax credit. And the lease ended up being $300 a month. What? Uh, it, which is competitive, even against combustion engine cars. That's really and cheap. So, so, you know, I don't own any Tesla stock, as you guys know, but I cover the company. And I tried in 2020 to get a Model Y, but it was a six to eight month waiting time because of the chip crisis. Yeah. And it was too expensive at that point. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see big picture whether those incentives work. The yeah. street sees 449,000 units in the quarter, yeah. sequential decline, but it's still pretty yeah. big growth year on year. Well, that's what I'm curious about. When we talk about this slump that we've seen, not mm. just for Tesla, but for EV makers overall, particularly in the latter half of last year, was that about price or was that about other issues and concerns about charging and range and things like that? It's, it's multiple factors. Yeah. And you raise a really good point in that um, Right now in America, compared with, say, China, we yeah. don't have a lot of consumer choice. There is a limit in the number of models, yeah. sizes of cars you can get, and yeah. price points. In China, it's a very different story. Yeah. Many more domestic makers offering many more models. There is growing evidence that basically the Model 3 or the Model Y, in Tesla's case, it just isn't for everyone. There isn't something out there right now that's hitting the sweet spot of the US consumer. Now, I leased. But if you think about the rate environment, financing costs are very high right now. Yeah. A $40,000 EV, who's that for? The median family uh, or median family income probably looks at that and goes, that's not for me. I need yeah. a big car that's super cheap. Yeah. Um, and I think this is the quarter where that will show. So, and then to that point, I mean, Elon Musk has said that, that like to lag from now until when you're able to release a cheaper model for, Correct. you know, under 20 or 25 where the everyday family can buy it, there will be softer growth. He's already flagged this, right? He called it two waves. So wave one mm -hmm. has been and gone. It's the model three and why. But in raising that, it's like, well, the addressable market, is that also gone? The $25,000 EV, and you guys know, Elon Musk says that something's coming in a okay. year. There, there is no $25,000 EV. Exactly. For there's the time there's being. There's barely a $40,000 EV. I, well, I, there is if you I, at least I, a time I, I went out there and shopped. We, we spent almost two years. For, we balked at some of the prices. We balked at the fact that, at least at the time we were looking, if you lease, you did not get the incentives right. relative that if you actually bought it out. And then, of course, there was the issue, other issues, range anxiety, things like that. Yes. And get my wife passed. But it gets to the broader issue that with all these new models that came on the market, why did we not see one that was, I guess, more affordable, if you will? Because it wasn't just Tesla. Yeah, in Tesla's case, uh, the, the idea of a twenty-five dollars or $20,000 EV became less of a priority. 
two years ago. It's something that was talked about for a while. Yeah. It got brought back. The way they get to $25,000 is through engineering. Yeah. But as Elon Musk is often late, but yeah. he does often deliver on the things he said were, will come. Uh, sometimes. One quick question, though, because sure. when we talk about internal combustion cars, there was always this idea you can offer a cheaper car. And to a certain extent, at least from the dealer's perspective, yes. they make a lot of that up in maintenance. Obviously, we know EV cars don't have the same maintenance cost that a combustion engine car. How much does that factor in this decision not to go down the price ladder? Uh, uh, what I found is going to yeah. be the next story is, is actually the reality of getting the incentives to the consumer's hands. So if you look at the state of California, where I reside, you've bought yourself an EV or you've leased one. Now what? You need a charger at home. Many of the incentives are income capped, where the household income cap is 104,000, for example, if you want the PG&E credit, right. uh, the utility credit for right. a charger. That excludes a really big portion of the state who may have got an EV and say, well, actually, now I need to confront the reality of the infrastructure. Um, one incentive that Tesla was offering at the end of the quarter just gone was 5,000 miles of free charging, okay. which if you think about how much it costs to fuel your car yeah. with gas, Somebody offered you 5,000 free miles, well, you'd be interested. Especially yep. in California, where it's like five bucks a gallon, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. that definitely does wind up helping. All right, Ed, thanks a lot. Let us know how that goes. Uh, Boomer's Technology host, uh, Ed Ludlow, joining us there. All right, coming up, we're counting you down to the closing bell. Jay Woods, Chief Global Strategist at Freedom Capital Markets, will be joining us right after this. On this first day of the second quarter, happy Monday. You almost made it. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. Ten minutes until we get to the closing bells here, Alex, on the first trading day of the month and of the quarter. And coming off, what, 10 percent gain to start the year for the S&P 500. A lot of questions right now as to whether that rally extends. Yeah, you can't complain yeah. too much. Uh, obviously, volume is light. Uh Public schools, at least here in New York, are closed, so there's a lot. Uh, maybe workers aren't totally back. Uh, the Russell underperforming today after doing pretty well in the first quarter. But, you know, as we see record high in gold, you also see the gold miners, uh, yeah. GDX, uh, coming in relatively strong. And Micron getting an upgrade, a uh, price target upgrade over at Bank of America. So, you know, there's still the pockets that continue to grind their way higher here. And you see that, even though we have right across the screen for the major indices. When you go down and you look at mm -hmm. the sector level, the group level, and, of course, the individual stocks, you see where the money's going. It's not going out of the market. It's just kind of rotating around. Right, and you now. wonder, does that continue? Yeah, and we had a chance to catch up at the start of the show with Jeremy Siegel, a University of Pennsylvania professor. He spoke a little bit earlier here about how much is left in the bull run. Stock prices get discounted at interest rates, and um, so that will give some headwind to stock prices. Notwithstanding, uh, the momentum is so strong in this market, I don't think it's over. I don't think this bull run is over. I think that uh, we have more to go. And that was Professor Jeremy Siegel kicking us off to the closing bell just about 50 minutes ago. And here to take us to those bells is Jay Woods, chief global strategist at Freedom Capital Markets. And Jay, I do want to key in on something Jeremy said there, specifically momentum here. When you look at a lot of the technical indicators, you see those support levels, you see the momentum. And even when you look back at sort of the historical almanacs here, everything, at least on paper, says there's a lot more left in the tank. Yeah, momentum yeah. begets momentum. We had back-to-back -back quarters of 10% gains. It's only happened eight times. Uh, at the end of the year, from a rally from November to March, so over the five months we've had now, we're up at the end of the year every single time. We're mm -hmm. eight for eight in that statistic. So the momentum is there. I think the setups are there. And what we're seeing is a classic rotation. And rotation in this market, that's the lifeblood of a secular bull market. We saw it at the end of last week. You know what the leading sectors were last week? No, what's that? Utilities and real estate. Uh, you know, technology, communications, discretionary. The three horsemen that have led us uh, for this great 2023 run yeah. and, and to start off 2024, we're, we're lagging, yet we were still up. So this to me is is positive. It's not going to be headline grabbing when you see a sector like materials making, you know, new highs for the 10th straight week in a row. Right. When NVIDIA did it for 11 weeks in a row, it was a headline. When materials do it, no, no one really cares. It's right. not up the percentage. But we're seeing under the surface, we had materials, we had industrials, mm -hmm. financials, the third leading sector. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite sector going forward. They kick off earnings. Why? Uh, why? Yeah. Oh, because they have a lot to reverse. Uh -huh. we, we, we know JP Morgan. That's, that's the gold standard when it 
comes to, you know, just the technicals behind it. Mm. But look at the regional banks. It was a year ago in March where every regional bank was taken to task for what happened with Silicon Valley and, and to other banks that, you know, unfortunately uh, went by the wayside. But historically, it wasn't the end of the world. No. We just had New York Community Bank. We had a scare there. No one else went down like New York Community. Yeah. There was no panic. And now you want to say technically? All right, we're making higher lows, we're breaking out, we're getting above the 200-day moving average in the Keith Brewett, Keith Brewett and Woods <laughs> Banking Index. Say yeah. that five times fast. We don't. That's we, why we I just say KBW. KBW. Oh, I know. KBW, KBW works. Going. That's fine. But what I'm seeing are great setups as we go into earnings season. Mm -hmm. Higher for longer narrative is here. It's here to stay, I believe. Mm -hmm. You know, we can talk rates if you'd like. But I think we're, gonna, we're absorbing it. We're mm -hmm. continuing to absorb it. And now if you have positive momentum... As earnings kick off, if the regional banks don't complain about deposits going down, the runway is there for 12, 15 percent upside across the board in the regionals. OK, so why is gold at a record high? You know, that is the biggest head scratcher to me in the world. Because based on what you said, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. No, everything. Why is Bitcoin at an all time high? Well, that's different <laughs> because, but no, but that feels that's like more of a, you know, capturing animal spirits kind of thing. Yeah, it's one of those things when you look at it historically, it doesn't make sense. It should be, you know, no one should be rushing into gold when the market's at all time highs. But the fact is, it is, there's momentum. And then you talked about the miners finally catching a bid. You're going to see a tailwind now go into the miners. Can it sustain? I think it can, and people are looking for undervalued stocks. We saw that the last two days of the quarter. The, the best performers the last two days were Tesla and Apple. Why? They were the two worst performers for the first quarter. People rotating into some of the dogs, some of the laggards, and they're looking for value. They may see it in some of those gold miners that have yet to follow you know, gold, which, no, I do not know why <laughs> logistically it is making all-time new highs. I just know the trend, the momentum is there, so you want to stick with the trade for now. I mean, we're right now still around 5,200 and change right now on the S&P. Most price targets on the street right now have us above 5,000 at the yep. end of the year and a lot of people above 5,200 here. We know it's not going to be linear. There, nothing in the market is ever linear here. How much should we anticipate or prepare for bumps along the way to wherever we end uh, in 2020? Oh, there, there will definitely be bumps. I, I don't know when exactly they'll happen. April has been the strongest month the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's up 16 out of 20, really 16 out of 18 if you you know, get out of 04 and 05 yeah, yeah. if you really want to fudge the numbers. Yeah. But uh, there are going to be months. We have three 5% retracements a year. We haven't retraced 2% from the high, yeah. and I believe it's 278 days. Yeah. So this run has been slow, steady. It's been epic as a trader. It's one of the more frustrating markets to trade because you don't expect it to go up every single day with no pullback. You finally get that pullback. And what have we been doing? We've been buying the dips or we've been going to the laggards. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why we saw energy and financials be two of the top three sectors so last it, quarter. So if you're going to buy like the value stuff, do you need to sell the rips and the tech stuff and the AI stuff? Well, people are doing that. You're seeing mm -hmm. it. And right now the semis look like a double top is forming right now. We could get a pullback. We get a pullback of 5 to 10 percent, which would be normal in, in NVIDIA and, and the rest of the sector. That will make headlines. It will probably take the overall market down 3 to 5 percent easily but watch what happens under the surface is it bringing down the whole market it hasn't yet i don't think it's going to happen anytime soon either all right jay always a great insights out of you jay woods over at freedom capital markets helping us count down to the closing uh, bells and you know just to kind of put a, a fine point on it we talk about you know the sectors and the idea that people are sort of rotating not necessarily pulling money from the market but just finding something that's maybe a little bit more attractive in value to park it Yep. And then do, is that enough to then to keep the overall indices uh, elevated? My question is, where's that money coming from? Is it coming from just cash on the sidelines? Is it coming from money market funds? Like, wh like wh where where is it coming out of to then rotate? Because you would have thought yeah. it would have come from money market funds or, say, big tech. And if that's not happening, where are we getting it? Well, you definitely see them some of the big tech names. I, I mean, obviously, money market's still at record highs. So yeah, I, I don't I think know. anything's come exactly. out of that just yet here. But it also gets to this idea, too, that, I mean, you can peel off some of the gains that you've had from some of these big mega cap names. You don't need to sell it that's all. True. You can peel off just a little couple bucks here and then find something that's undervalued in the mid and small cap space. Yep, that's a great point. So you can kind of have both and you're barbelling, right? Because then you have the value. I don't think we can call it value anymore. Just sort of like growth yeah. here. Why are you laughing at Yeah, me? I feel like we just need to have an obituary for just value stuff. I know. It's not, it's not really it, a thing it, anymore. It, no, you just can't say that. But like, I know I'm it, offending all the value folks out there, but what is value right but now? But to just say value makes it seem like, oh, we've done that trade. It hasn't worked, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, like, you know, the materials, the industry versus say the tech. All right, a full breakdown here of the first day of trading of the new quarter. Stick with us. We're about to take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the
the bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. Joined right now by Scarlett Fu in the television studio. Carol Masser and Tim Senevic in the radio booth as we welcome our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms. First trading day here, uh, Carol Masser uh, of the new quarter. Mm. Not much price action here. In fact, seen a modest sell-off across the board. The Nasdaq holding on to modest gains of about a tenth of a percent. Yeah, a little bit of an uptick, I feel like, in the last few minutes of trading. But yeah, kind of ho-hum, if you will, certainly on the equity side of things. But what's interesting is we were talking earlier with our Ira Jersey about the ISM manufacturing this morning. And I'm kind of like, you know, we always talk about the importance that we're a service-led economy. He said, I think it was an important uh, report and showing an uptick uh, for the first time since, what, September of 2022. The significance is, he says, manufacturing mm -hmm. leads the economy. So uh, maybe that's uh, certainly some positive momentum in what that means for the Fed, maybe they're going to be on hold longer. Yeah, well, speaking of the Fed being on hold longer, we checked in with Torsten Slock uh, over at Apollo. Uh, he's the chief economist, his partner there, Scarlett. And um, he held to his view. You know, remember that note a month ago where he came out and said the Fed's not going to uh, cut rates this year? Mm -hmm. Well, he said it was a little lonely a month ago, and it's less lonely now because <laughs> more and more people are coming into his corner right now. And more data... We're getting to back that up, whether it's that ISM data that Carol mentioned, um, IPO markets heating up. Um, he says it's really difficult to see that this doesn't give a tailwind to GDP growth in the coming months. Yeah, he's feeling vindicated. Although, remember, last week we were all about the PCE and, and how that was going to set the tone. I feel like we forgot all about that in the wake of the ISM manufacturing numbers. But that just sort of pointed to his point uh, as well in terms of the stronger underlying economy remain. Well, at least for one data point, it seems to suggest that. You overlay that with the other data points, and I guess so. You're starting to see expectations in this market shift a little bit on the first trading day of the new quarter. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lower by about 240 points or about six tenths of a percent. The S&P lower by 11 points or two tenths of a percent, while the Nasdaq Composite holding on to gains on the day up a tenth of a percent here. But the big laggard on the day, you're actually going to find that more in the cyclical and small cap space. Dow Transport's down a percent on the day. The Russell 2000 down by a similar amount. All right, let's get into some of uh, the large caps in terms of the uh, overall trade. 134 names in the S&P 500 higher today, Scarlett. You've got 368 to the downside, so certainly more of a risk-off trade in the overall trade. Uh, maybe no surprise there, and two unchanged. Yeah, let's take a look at how it all uh, shakes out on the IMAP, because you've got two of the three biggest sectors in the uh, in the green. Excuse me, communication services and infotech. They're up, although communication services is really the only one that is up decidedly, gaining 1.5% energy moving higher with oil prices and tech just eking out a gain. Eight other sectors are in the red, led by real estate investment trusts losing 1.8 percent, healthcare down nine tenths of one percent, and industrials losing ground. One of the outperformers in the first quarter uh, losing eight tenths of one percent. All right, let's get to some of the individual gainers, if I may. Uh, Micron Technology, number one gainer in the NASDAQ 100, uh, number two gainer in the S&P 500. This one at its highest today, guys, was up as much as 8%, finishing the day with about a 5.5% gain. Uh, B of A raising its price target uh, on uh, Micron specifically to 144 from 120, stock closing at 124 and change today. Uh, B of A saying that it sees strong growth potential for high bandwidth memory products, noting that they are critical to AI. Uh, by by the way, the stock has been on quite a tear since uh, it came out with earnings and talked about its AI outlook, boosted that outlook. That was back on March 20th. It has gained around 30% since that earnings update, so quite a run there. Um, Socks also was an outperformer today. It was up more than 1%. Uh, another name that caught my attention, this was your top gainer in the S&P 500. We're talking about 3M, uh, finishing the day with about a gain of about 6%. Uh, this is after it previously announced settlement uh, agreement with the U.S. public water suppliers received final approval from the U.S. District Court in Charleston, South Carolina. That federal court uh, approved 3M's offer of at least $10 billion to settle PFAS claims of roughly 12,000 public water systems across the United States. So uh, you know the story. Uh, resolve some litigation and overhang, and you often see a stock pop. So 3M up, as I said, uh, about 6% in today's session. One more, Wynn Resorts up about 4 and a quarter percent in today's session. It was a top gainer uh, in the S&P 500 on heavier volume than usual. 
usual. Uh, data out from Macau noting that Macau's March casino revenue rises 53.1% year over year. The estimate was just below uh, or just above 49%, 49.2%. So some big outperformance there when, as you know, uh, their biggest revenue chunk does come from Macau. So a winner in today's session. Hey, let's get to uh, some of the decliners here. I do want to start with uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance shares, the worst performer uh, in the S&P 500 today, closing down close to 10%, 9.9%. Uh, in fact, shares closed at their lowest going all the way back to 2010. The company did last week report results and it narrowed its fiscal 2024 guidance. It cited a challenging retail environment, uh, reduced spending from the consumer. Shares initially gained after that, uh, but then it gave up those gains as analysts uh, remain concerned about the company's earnings outlook. Separately, uh, investors also learned in a filing that the IRS is looking for $2.7 billion in unpaid taxes from the company due to alleged issues over transfer pricing. This comes after audits of previous tax years. Uh, shares of FedEx also slipping on the day today. They fell as much as 3.6%, closing down 3.3% after the company announced its contract with the United States Postal Service will not renew upon its expiry in September. The parties were unable to reach an agreement on mutually beneficial terms to extend the contract. Negotiations did conclude on March 29th following extensive talks. Uh, and then let's check out what shares of uh, DJT, um, Trump Media and Technology, ended up doing today. Um, they wiped out their gains from going public, down 21.5% today. This after the company disclosed it lost more than $58 million it, last year. Uh, revenue for the former president's Truth Social platform started to uh, trickle in. The company generated $4.1 million in revenue for the full year. Uh, we don't know how many active users it has, uh, but in its prospectus in February, it uh, said that Truth Social has about 9 million signups across its platform. Shares fell as much as 27% earlier, but down, uh, closing down uh, over 21%. That stock is just so fascinating, especially when you yeah. know that its majority owner, biggest shareholder at some point is probably going to be selling shares. It's just, it's amazing to me. Okay, looking at the bond market, we're seeing a nice move in the bond market. Uh, we're on offer here. You get back end yields up by 11, 12 basis points. And that was all the ISM manufacturing data that Carol was just talking about. You saw that expansion. You saw prices paid. You, you did see the unemployment or the employment index actually move lower. So there are layoffs happening. But we were talking to Tim Fiore, who heads up the data, and he was saying that maybe by June, those layoffs will help resolve itself. And, and, and he's relatively positive here, particularly on new orders, guys. Yeah, I mean, and I thought, I mean, this report, I mean, it's funny, we have, we've kind of been ignoring these manufacturing reports for a while because we're I told that do. it didn't matter. I but them. But it was, I, I really encourage everyone to go and read it because you do get a better sense here as to what the conundrum is going to end up being for uh, the Fed, Carol. Yeah, speaking of manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing problems are over at Boeing are certainly leading to some additional problems at United Airlines. United Airlines, guys, asking pilots to take some unpaid time off next month, blaming late deliveries of new aircraft from Boeing. And so they're reducing the delays in getting the aircraft and so on, uh, reducing the number of hours that United had planned that its pilots would fly this year. This is a story that we've been hearing out of the carriers. Yeah, um, United was set to have received 80 MAX 10s this year, part of an outstanding order with Boeing for 277 of the planes. Uh, the airline, though, has been working with Boeing to convert some of its MAX 10 orders to the smaller MAX 8 or 9 variants to receive the planes sooner. Um, also talking with Airbus to try to get some of those A321neos sooner. But, I mean, we're talking airplanes here. You, Airbus has sold out of A320s through the end of the decade. So, I mean, it's not as easy as just calling up. Yeah, this is going to multi be a multi-year problem. Yeah. And of course, mm -hmm. the FAA has already said it's looking into United's operations and going to be encouraging it to slow down its growth. So the lesson for all of us is don't take United this summer. Well, doesn't this also mean that prices are going to be higher? I mean, if you have to take out yeah. pilots and in, in demand, capacity, right? right? Yeah. Like, are we just paying more? Yeah, well, that was my first. When I read that story, everyone's so focused on the pilots. I'm like, what does that mean for me? More, I mean, more, more. I just bought. I mean, I just. I mean, I just bought a ticket, a couple tickets to go down to uh, Florida. You have a private was, jet, though. It it's like, not a problem. You know right? how much it was? How much? It was a lot. And, and, it's not, and it's not even first class, Tim. When I had, to fly, to, I had to fly coach. When you That's how Florida? bad things are. Hurts. I thought everyone was leaving Florida. I thought so too. And and that is true. Did you guys see this New York Post yeah. article where it's like people go down to Florida and now they're like, hey, well, wait a minute. I don't <laughs> like it anymore. This is not what I expected. Climate change, right? And other issues. It's Climate getting really change. hot. And, uh, you know, they're really worried about kind of some it, of the things that are happening. It's there, really hot and they can't get insurance on their homes and mm -hmm. everything costs a lot really? more. So they're was like, that, you know what? It's, it's better up north. Was that not an issue? Like, 
when everyone in started moving there. In the last couple of years, no, no, no. So in the last the couple of years, it's gotten hotter. No, no, no. After the, the last, last couple of years, they couldn't get insurance. After the pandemic, the insurance companies jacked up the premiums. No, definitely. I guarantee you. Are those, you those questioning premiums, that post story? Is that what you're doing? Right I'm now? saying those premiums were high before they moved down there. I'm saying they when everybody higher. was moving down there in the middle of February, everyone said, "Yeah." Miami is great in February. What does it feel like in July and August? But and the they got a taste of that, and everybody fled back to New York. But the insurance claims have got the insurance um, plants, are, yeah, have gotten really expensive, and they're yep. just companies you just can't deal with. Uh, some of the costs when, as a result of either climate change or they go naked, storms. right? They just you don't, don't need have insurance. insurance. Yeah, just you know, no, you do need just insurance. ride it out. <laughs> it's also and, then, hot. and then where do you live? It's and also it, hot and humid in New York in the summer, guys. Let's not pretend this is not you know, like Miami. No. Let's not pretend me? this is California. All right, guys. Yeah. All right. But where else are you going to walk the streets and dodge all the rats? And uh, <laughs> you know it when it starts to really stink on the subway. Garbage. Anyway, I can't wait, Romain. I can't wait till you start your own travel channel. Channel. It could be <laughs> is that really it? Interesting. Yeah, it could be really the next interesting. Career. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys. That's a wrap. Uh, wrapping up our Monday uh, close here um, on Radio TV, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. So we will see you same time, same place tomorrow. And we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television. Today, a new law in California goes into effect that actually raises the minimum wage for fast food workers. A lot of concerns about how that's going to impact, well, those companies and more importantly, the price that you pay. A conversation coming up about the effects. This is coming up on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu with Romaine Bostic. This was the first day of the second quarter after two straight quarters of double-digit gains in the S&P 500. We saw a modest decline, off by one-fifth of 1%. One big, big moves in the Treasury market. The 10-year yield going up 11 basis points, 4.31%. At one point, it got to 4.33%. Uh, the ISM manufacturing numbers much better than expected. It showed the first expansion since September of 2022 and raises all sorts of questions about whether the Fed is going to follow through on three interest rate cuts this year. Crude oil continues to move north, up nine-tenths of one percent right now. Uh, and, of course, this is crude oil that had gained 7.4 percent in the month of March uh, and has now notched three straight months of gains in 2024. And Bloomberg dollar index gaining ground, up three-tenths of one percent, gaining against all G10 currencies as well. Let's move on to some individual movers here. FedEx was down more than three percent after saying that its contract with the United States Postal Service will end at the end of September. Instead, its rival UPS has won that air cargo contract. Now, Morgan Stanley says that while that contract was seen as a low profitability deal, it, there might be some potential margin drag. So that's one reason why the stock is lower. Walgreens Boots Alliance reported earnings, uh, narrowed its full year guidance, citing a tough retail environment. 3M jumping 6% on the day after it won final court approval for its settlement with public water utilities regarding those forever chemicals. 3M had agreed to pay up to $12.5 billion to different water utilities to treat for those permanent uh, forever chemicals. And CX app, the ticker here is CXAI, so you, you can kind of get a sense of what's happening here. More than doubling in value today after it announced a partnership with Google Cloud. This was the best performer in the Russell 2000. Romain? All right, today, most California fast food workers are actually going to see their wages grow from about 16 bucks to $20 an hour as a new minimum wage law kicks in. Obviously not without controversy, not just for the law itself, but more importantly, how it's being implemented. Andrew Oxford is joining us now, covering this for us over at Bloomberg Law. And Andrew, on the surface, this seems, well, practical, right? We've been calling for higher wages for lower, uh, lower wage workers. You get it, but a big question here as to why this is only going to fast food chains, and more importantly, whether the rollout has been equitable. Kind of walk us through what's actually happening today. Sure. It comes down to a debate around what do we talk about when we talk about fast food, right? Uh, this law is going to cover a lot of the big brands you would expect, McDonald's, Burger King, but it's not necessarily narrow either. Uh, it covers companies, uh, chains with uh, more than 60 locations nationwide that offer a limited table service. So that would rule out, say, Chili's, but uh, there are ongoing questions about whether that would include, say, an ice cream chain, something like that. And uh, I think we'll really get a better sense only in the coming months of where this law applies and where it doesn't. 
the Department of Industrial Relations here in California, which oversees the law, has pointed owners of, of businesses to a sort of a Q&A on their website. Mm -hmm. uh, and we might have to look to uh, the courts or a newly created fast food council to really sort out some of the finer details of where exactly this law applies. So, Andrew, I read that there's a whole lot of controversy about bread stores like Panera maybe being exempt from this law. What, what's going on here? Yeah, so there is an exemption for restaurants that serve and sell bread as a standalone menu item. And this looked like, and uh, Bloomberg News has reported on how this really stood to benefit Panera, uh, and particularly a Panera franchise owner who was a donor to Governor Gavin Newsom's campaign. The state has since said that actually they don't believe Panera would benefit from this exemption because it applies to companies that sell bread they make on site, not bread that's brought in. Uh, so as you can tell, some of the exemptions here are murky. They are uh, part of what the governor himself has described as the sausage making around all of this. And the landscape continues to change too. Just last week, Governor Newsom signed a law that added more exemptions for fast food restaurants and places like airports, stadiums, theme parks. This came at the urging of another labor union, uh, Unite Here, which represents workers in a lot of those facilities and says they already make more money and this would create some overlap between what the law is doing and what the union is doing. So it, it's still kind of a changing picture. Yeah, and of course now these companies have to adapt, adjust, and of course react. Andrew Oxford over at Bloomberg Law as we continue a conversation about implementation of this new law. And one chain that's going to be hit by it is the hot dog vendor Dog House, about 67 locations, mostly out there in California. Pleased to say joining us right now is the CEO, Michael Montagano, the CEO over at Dog House. Michael, great to have you here on the program. We talk about wages going up, roughly $4 an hour on average here. How does that affect your employee base? You know, as you pointed out, we operate in 12 states across the country. Uh, we have approximately 60 locations across those 12 states. About half of those locations happen to be here in California. And so obviously a hospitality focused company like ours, uh, our customers, number one, is uh, the increase of um, wages certainly have an impact on our business. Our focus has been on how to, instead of arguing um, or trying to figure out how the pie is broken up, how to make the pie larger. Mm -hmm. And in, so we've leaned into technology initiatives to actually enhance the customer experience. That includes kiosks in the store that allow customers to see visual images of the uh, food and select it and have add-ons. Right. We've seen customer experience extraordinarily high. Ticket prices um, have increased as well, which has increased. Um, uh, it's a win-win for everyone. We've so, also so enabled... Yep, sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm just curious in terms of making up that cost. Are you saying that some of that technology and the other stuff that you're implementing, does that lower cost for you in a way that sort of makes up for that increase in wages? Is that what you're getting at here? Yeah, look, I think it's it's about how do we actually increase throughput through the restaurants, drive more customers into the restaurants, enhance their experience so they want to spend more of their hard earned dollars within the store. Mm -hmm. Part of that is diversifying the ordering experience. Kiosks, QR code ordering from their mobile at the table, launching a new uh, mobile application for pickup and delivery. If there's one thing about our industry is that it is extraordinarily resilient. Right. We saw that during COVID-19, and I think this will be no exception. Uh, we will continue to innovate sure. and find ways to enhance the customer experience um, without affecting earnings in our restaurants. Okay. Have any of the franchisees had to reduce staff count or at least freeze hiring because of this new law? I understand the, the shift to technology and uh, making sure that the experience for the customer remains intact, if not enhanced. But what about staffing? Look, it, part of ensuring the customer experience, and I think you see this across the board, whether it's fast casual, QSR, casual dining, uh, with input costs that have increased you know, over the last couple of years, inflationary pressures in uh, tow, um, many uh, uh, restaurants continue to operate at optimal or very thin levels. And so I think it's more about how do we enhance the experience rather than pulling back on labor levels within the stores. Our franchisees will obviously make this decision on a store by store basis, uh, re you know, regarding pricing as well as on labor levels. But our focus has been on giving them tools uh, to enhance the experience, drive more volume within the store and do so efficiently right. in a labor level. 
So, Michael, you mentioned you're letting franchisees make a lot of the decisions, make their own decisions when it comes to staffing, when it comes to pricing. Does that mean the doghouse in Burbank might have a different price for the Old Town house dog than the Pasadena branch? I think you'll see across all pr franchise networks, whether it's doghouse or other franchises across the uh, country, um, restaurants across the country, that uh, there's price disparity in general between uh, a location in Metro Los Angeles, as you had referenced, or one in Barbersville, West Virginia. Um, there are different trade areas, uh, certainly different purchasing powers. Um, and, and so we ultimately give uh, some autonomy to our franchisees in order to figure out what's best for their community, what's best for their store, their customers, and, and their uh, team members are certainly one component of that as well. I am curious, uh, Michael, when we talk about this California initiative, it'd be remiss in not pointing out that we've seen other initiatives in other states and in some local jurisdictions. So this is, does seem to be a broader trend that's been going on as to sort of finding ways to lift that minimum wage, whether it's specific to fast food workers or something broader, like uh, what we've seen out of the federal government here. As you sort of strategize going forward, longer term, for your business here, are you sort of preparing for a world where that baseline wage is just going to be materially higher than maybe when you started? Yeah, look, we've taken hard looks and continue to innovate and make efficient and take efficiency measures on things like the supply chain, like building costs, um, like all aspects of our restaurant marketing and technology continues to be a major component of that all to bring down the costs uh, to operate a restaurant as a consequence of what we've seen, not just in the last day here in California, but across the country over the past uh, two years on uh, really significant inflationary pressure that's driven mm -hmm. wages up. And so we continue to focus on every aspect um, of the restaurant in order to bring costs down to make it um, continue to be, like on our platform, a very sure. profitable opportunity for our franchisees around the country. Yeah, you control what you can control, right? Doghouse CEO Michael Montagano, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about the new fast food law in California that raises the minimum wage to $20 an hour. You know, he mentioned those kiosks, which are great until they don't work, and then you have to get in line. There's only one person serving way too many customers. Yeah, but, I mean, that's been the trend. I mean, we've seen how the big, bigger chains like McDonald's have clearly leaned all into that, and yep. I get what he's saying here. You know, if you have higher labor costs, you try to find ways to mitigate it. Maybe automation helps if they get it right. Um, I do want to pivot before we move on here real quickly, Scarlett. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually did get some earnings today. This out of PVH, which owns the Hilfiger, Calvin Klein brands, uh, down about 16% here in after hours trading. The fourth quarter numbers did beat adjusted EPS at 372, revenue at $2.5 billion, a beat on both metrics, but the guidance, awful. Full year mm -hmm. revenue, they're seeing a drop of 6 to 7%. 1Q revenue, they're seeing a drop of 11% here. Uh, and as far as uh, EPS for the full year, they're looking at about ten seventy five dollars to $11 a share below well below what the street was looking for. Those shares now down 18%. Yeah, it reminds me of what a Walgreens said also, this tough retail environment in the coming year. All yeah. right, we've got much more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Now for the top three, where we name drop the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories. And first up is Ryan Reynolds. The one year ago, the actor invested in a Canadian payments company called Nuve. Now that company is now being taken private by Advent International. So Ryan Reynolds, uh, quite the picker of companies. I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little confused here. I've lost track of everything he's invested know, in, but I feel like he's a better investor than he is an actor at this point. I mean, and that's not a knock on his acting abilities, but this guy has really got the golden touch. Yeah, I mean, forget following Nancy Pelosi's trades. I want to know what, what uh, Ryan Reynolds is going to invest in next. Uh, speaking of uh, another uh, somewhat celebrity, I guess, if you will, that's also making a lot of money, uh, Christian Louboutin, of course, the maker of those famous red bottom shoes. According to Forbes, now a billionaire. Yeah. The value of his company, or at least his brand, I should say, uh, right now above $3 billion. And his stake uh, in that uh, brand uh, roughly estimated at around $1.1 billion. So uh, not bad, you know, for a guy who makes shoes. Absolutely. Yeah. By the way, um, that red has its own Pantone code. Did you yes, know that? Yes, I, I did know that. And there's <laughs> been a lot of lawsuits and uh, over uh, whether you can actually trademark a, a yes. color. But as uh, he found out, yeah, you can. All right. Well, let's yeah. talk about someone else who's worn a lot of Louboutins in her lifetime. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, her group 
lifestyle company is being sued for labeling one of its products with the message Good Clean Goop. Now, the plaintiff is a company called Good Clean Love, which is in the same sector and sells similar products. So it says... What sector is this, uh, Scarlett Fu? Um, female healthcare <laughs> products. Uh, I love this story, by the way, and we won't get too into the details of what you use this product for. But I find it funny because these just seem like regular words, right? Like yeah. anybody could take these words, put them on a product. I mean, how do they have a claim that somehow this is somehow, so some type Good of infringement? So Good Clean Love says that it yeah. causes reverse confusion because consumers might think that Goop, which is more well-known, yes. may be the source of Good Clean Love's products uh, and not Good Clean Products itself. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, reverse confusion. Well, That's Goop has basically term. said this is meritless and... As you'd expect. There. But I don't know. I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow, she's got a pretty good track record in court, you know. So I don't know <laughs> if you want to mess with her. That's a good all point. Right. All right. Those are our top three here for the day. When we come back, we're actually going to take a look back at the creation of, well, what would become the gold standard mainstay of discount stock brokerages. We're talking about Charles Schwab. Leave you with the question to ponder as we take a short break here. In 2019, Scarlett Schwab cut its trading commission for online clients to zero. Mm -hmm. How much was the lowest commission 20 years Ooh. ago today? Single digits for sure. Well, the answer when we come back. This is Bloomberg. All right, looking back on this day, April 1st, 1971, Charles Schwab and two partners who had been writing an investment newsletter together entered the brokerage business, officially incorporating as First Commander Corp. Within two years, Schwab had bought out his partners and renamed the company after himself. Fortuitous timing indeed, because barely two years later, the SEC unintentionally created a launching pad for Schwab and the discount brokerage model. Remember, the New York Stock Exchange, since its creation at that time, required members to charge a minimum commission rate. Back then, that largely meant individual investors got stuck with high fixed commissions, while institutional investors secretly negotiated lower ones. The SEC in 1975 changed that, banning fixed income commissions, a decision that curiously led many Wall Street firms to actually raise fees in order to pad their profits. But Schwab swam against the tide, slashing the price of a stock trade on the platform by as much as 70 percent and then setting up a toll free telephone number to educate the masses. In one year, Schwab's revenue more than tripled. By 1979, the company had 90,000 accounts, and by 1980, like a grizzly bear perched above a salmon run, that company was ready when that decades-long industry migration to retail investing kicked off, driving scores of mom-and-pop investors into the arms of Schwab. Unfortunately, that torrential growth almost did kill the company, and after a failed IPO, it agreed in 1983 to sell itself to Bank of America. That relationship had lasted just four years. A frustrated Chuck Schwab led a management buyout and took the firm public on his own. And for years after that, it was, and to a certain extent still is, the gold standard of retail investing, even today finding ways to stun its competitors. That includes back in 2019 when it slashed trading commissions for online clients to zero from $4.95 per trade, a long way away from the discounted fee it used to charge 20 years ago at $19.95 back in 2004, or $29.95 in the years prior. That zero fee strategy, it was a big bet that Schwab's traditional bank deposit business could alone drive profits. It was a strategy that did work when interest rates were pinned near zero, but of course a strategy that unraveled when the Fed rapidly raised rates. That pushed Schwab deposits lower, unrealized losses higher, and the stock plunged 50% in barely a year. The company's earnings report last January showed continued declines in profit, new assets, and deposits. But the CEO, Walt Bettinger, said on that conference call that he anticipates steadily improving financial results throughout the year and a very strong exit into 2025. We're going to find out soon enough whether Walt got it right. The company's next earnings report slated to hit just about two weeks from today. I can't imagine if the company stayed as first commander corp. It just doesn't have the same <laughs> ring as Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab is so etched in everyone's memories. I mean, as a commercial, ask Chuck for everything. So um, great, great uh, almanac entry for today, Romain. Let's move on to AI and the Internet, because Mozilla was very vocal about the nature of open source and AI when the European Union proposed the AI Act. Well, now it has turned its attention to the U.S., Mozilla, along with the Center for Democracy and Technology and other groups, sent a letter to U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. They urged her to protect openness and transparency in artificial intelligence. The letter, the letter highlights how an open ecosystem can advance innovation 
and protect civil rights. Joining us now for more is Mark Sermon, president of Mozilla Foundation, a global nonprofit that often advocates for the safety and integrity of users online. Mark, it's good to speak with you. Thank you so much. Um, we start off by just explaining uh, the EU's AI Act. I wonder to what extent that kind of sets the tone for the U.S. and everyone else who's trying to come up with regulation, policy, rules of the road for AI. It, I mean, it absolutely sets the tone. It's the first comprehensive AI legislation we have in the world. And as we look at sort of the, the hype and the potential of AI, uh, people being really worried about what might happen, huge valuations, we need to get realistic about what do we actually want? And the EAI Act just kind of lays out this idea that where we should put our attention is on things that are high risk, healthcare, bias in things like hiring and insurance. Yeah. Um, and that's the right place to start. We, we hope that's going to happen in other countries. I, I am curious, though, how we square the circle here, Mark. I mean, particularly when we talk about Mozilla, which has really been kind of at the forefront of open source uh, internet uh, tools, we should say, just overall, whether it's browsers or anything else. Uh, but we're at this stage now where we're also seeing kind of either the limitations or the risk of that open source model, particularly with something as sensitive as ChatGPT and some of these generative AI bots. What, though, is a solution? I mean, you can't really build this without that kind of open collaboration, can you? I mean, you absolutely can build that with the, the open collaboration. And our worry actually is that there are some companies who are out there advocating to put constraints on open source or to put in place regulatory regimes that would really set the bar so high that those researchers, those academics, people like Mozilla or the Linux Foundation can't actually produce open source software. There'd just be too high a compliance um, regime. And you know, our sense is open source is absolutely critical to uh, an economy and AI that invites small players, invites different regions, and can offer the kind of transparency that allows us to pursue safety. So that's what we're looking at as, as we kind of look at the NTIA, the government of um, the government's looking into open source is you want to strike that balance. And strike a balance, so at a time where we've already seen the, some of the negative aspects of this, or at least the idea that bad actors can use this in a way that can really sort of change the world. We're in an election cycle in the U.S. and, quite frankly, around a good portion of the world, and we've already seen the net effects of that. Is that genie sort of just out of the bottle and can't be put back in? Like, here's the thing. AI and elections can make a frightening pair. You've got, you know, misinformation uh, already, kind of recommendation engines driven by AI and social media networks that have helped that misinformation spread, increasingly easy to create synthetic content. And so we have to, you know, that genie is out of the bottle. Um, it was out of the bottle in previous election cycles. And what we've seen is that platforms have tried to tackle that with self-regulation. Even, you know, whether that's Meta or Facebook or OpenAI now, which is trying to make it so you can't write election spam. Hmm. And we've seen that self-regulation isn't the answer. It actually doesn't stop the tide effectively enough, especially in smaller markets where you see these companies not putting resources in. Mm -hmm. And what we need is laws. We need laws that prioritize transparency, laws that, you know, are making algorithms more transparent, where we can see what is synthetic content, where independent watchdogs can keep an eye on the platforms. And those are laws that we don't have yet. We yeah. have a bit in Europe, but definitely not in the US. And those will take years to write as well. Um, from where you sit, what can and needs to be done before the election in November? Is there anything that, that can be done quickly? I think there's, there's two things I would think quickly. One is, as I mentioned, independent watchdogs. So there was a, a, a watchdog called the New York Times Ad Observatory which was monitoring how um, you know, election advertising and misinformation was being spread on social media platforms. And watchdogs like that have been shut out by companies like Meta because they don't want people snooping around. We need to make sure that things are open for watchdogs in this election. But frankly, we're not going to be able to do enough fast enough. So people need to protect themselves. You know, we need to actually be skeptical about what we see. It's that simple. All right, Marco, well said. We're going to have to leave it there. Mark Sermon, the president of the Mozilla 
a foundation. And they have a lot of good stuff, uh, Scarlett, uh, on their website where they kind of talk about the risk and the opportunities out there. One interesting thing that caught my eye as I was sort of preparing for this, they were talking about how you can use ChatGPT and some of these AI tools to actually build out your resume. Yes, and yeah. that's because so many people think that you've got AI systems or software reading your resume, so you might as well have um, AI compose your resume as well, so that AI is talking to AI, as opposed to you, Romain Basica, a human being, writing a, a resume for what you think is a person, but actually is AI. And, and then, do they actually hire a human, or do they just hire, yeah, that's a, a, question hire my they avatar might, or They might something. not get back to you, that's the problem. <laughs> All right, well, that's one use for it here, and one thing we talk a lot about on this show is how AI is more than hype. It really is actually being applied out there already, including in the biotech sector. Hopefully some companies think it actually streamlined the process of drug discovery, drug testing, et cetera. Joining us now is the head of AI over at Ginkgo Bioworks. Her name is Anna Marie Wagner, and she's also the senior vice president of corporate development there. And Anna Marie, great to have you here uh, on the program because we talk about so much the risk involving uh, AI and generative AI and all the gloom and doom. And look, we know that's out there, but we've already seen a lot of companies find constructive ways to use this that actually might have more longer term material benefits for all of us here. And one area where this has come up time and time again is in the pharmaceutical space. How exactly do you use this to actually speed up that drug discovery process? Absolutely, and, and thanks for having me. I think one of the important things to remember is that we didn't invent the language of biology. When I say we, I mean human beings. We invented human language, we didn't invent DNA. And so AI is already getting to the point where it can understand so much more about the substrate than we as human beings can. And so its ability to process these huge amounts of data that are coming out of labs like our lab here in Boston to help us understand like really how does it work and how can we leverage that information to, as you said, discover new medicines, discover more sustainable food sources, discover more sustainable materials yeah. is really incredible. Where is this coming from? I mean, for Ginkgo itself, is this homegrown? I saw you have a, a partnership with Google. How much of this technology and more importantly, the cost uh, and time that it's needed to really build this out uh, can be done by Ginkgo alone? And how much of it do you need a partner like a Google or another big tech company like that? Yeah, well, there, look, there are three main ingredients to any AI model. There's uh, compute, and we're really thankful for our partnership with Google uh, to provide us with the level of compute that we need to build the scale of models that we're building. Uh, you need talent, which we're fortunate to have. But for us, the big piece was always the, the data. And in biology, again, unlike human language, the data is really hard and expensive to generate. And so that is why we have invested in the level of automation that we've built here, because our view has always been that the limiting factor to taking advantage of AI in the field of biology is going to be the availability of high quality training data. So, Anna Marie, we were just talking to Mark Sturman of the Mozilla Foundation about their push uh, to keep, of course, um, AI and open source available to everyone accessible as opposed to a closed model. What does that look like from where you sit uh, in the biotech space? Yeah, look, I think there is a lot that we could be doing to better support the sort of the, the academic and open science community. Again, there is there is a bit of a gap between the resources that are available at a place like Ginkgo or at some of our large pharma partners and what is available to the broader academic community. And one of the things I'm really excited about is AI's ability to democratize access to some of these tools and make uh, you know, our type of resources available to folks that are doing foundational research in, in the space. Um, I do think we also need to think a lot about trust and safety, and it's why we've invested so heavily in biosecurity over the years as well, in addition to all of our work on the bioengineering side. There's biosecurity and then there's also cybersecurity. As you spend more on AI, you obviously need to spend more to, to ensure that your system is safe as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're thinking through uh, the needs to build up, fortify uh, the, the safety part component here? Yeah, well, we've always invested heavily in data security and cybersecurity because it's core to, to our business. Um, our view was always that you know the value of our platform and the trust in this industry is going to be dependent on our ability to protect that platform. But for us, our investments in biosecurity go well beyond that um, because our view is, look, even if these, uh, these threats don't emerge because of AI, this is biology. Mother Nature is throwing stuff at us all the time. And so we need to be building the tools to very quickly identify and respond to biological threats while also using those same tools 
to create all the opportunities that we see in drug discovery and, and other fields. Yeah, Mother Nature and hackers, both threats, of course, <laughs> to everyone. Uh, Anna Marie Wagner, thank you so much for joining us, head of AI and SVP of corporate development at Ginkgo BioWorks. And Romain, we're, of course, wrapping up uh, the first day, the first trading day yeah. of the second quarter. We had two straight quarters of double digit gains. So yeah. the question is, what comes next? I mean, can you continue this blistering pace? I don't know. We were speaking with Jay Woods earlier. I mean, he's more of a market technician. He said, mm -hmm. when you look at the technicals, yeah. And then earlier we were talking about the guy who runs the Stock Traders Almanac. He's like, when you look at history, when you go five straight months from November into yeah. March, according to him, every single time, I think it's been eight occasions, you ended up with higher gains over the following nine months. Uh, but it could be a rocky But that's road. history. And yeah. we know history doesn't always repeat. Exactly. Also, yeah. we have, you know, a, a couple of yeah. big events this year. Uh, yeah, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> the S&P 500 closing down two tenths of one percent. Yields moving up. Uh, they're selling across the curve there. The 10 year yield going up to four point three one percent. At one point, it reached four point three three percent. And oil continues to be a source of inflation concerns, uh, moving up by nine tenths of one percent. Yeah, definitely something I think we should keep an eye on for the next couple of weeks, the uh, next couple of months. This is the close on Bloomberg. At a time when Donald Trump is cutting into Joe Biden's 2020 advantage with young adults, the growing list of grievances among that 18 to 29 year old set with the economy as a top issue is a worrying sign for the president. Pessimism is spiking the most among those under the age of 30. So let's break it all down with Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines, co-host of Balance of Power. Kaylee, it's always about the economy, stupid, but for the 18 to 29 year old set, they're really obsessed with the economy. Yeah, even more so than they were in the last election cycle, Scarlett. Of course, young voters were part of that coalition that elected President Biden to the White House in the first place, and he is going to be relying on them if he wants to be reelected to a second term. The issue, as you allude to, though, according to Gallup uh, polling, suggests that those 18 to 29 have an issue with the economy. 47 percent of them say the economy is the top issue. Back in 2020, only 11 percent said that. So clearly growing as a priority. There's a number of factors that could play into that, including the fact that student loans, uh, which had a moratorium on payments during the pandemic, now have to be repaid once again. That's coupled with a higher cost of living overall, including higher rent uh, that young people have to pay and higher mortgage rates that may prohibit them uh, from buying a home. So all of that is a factor here and could very well translate at the ballot box. According to our own pol uh, polling that Bloomberg has done together with Morning Consult, our latest polling in the seven key swing states that could decide this election, Trump is currently winning with voters uh, aged up to 34. 47 percent said they would vote for him in November compared to just 40 that would vote for Biden. So this is really a demographic that the president is likely to focus on. Certainly, he has attempted to do things. He's relieved already about one hundred and forty four billion dollars in student debt for specific groups like those with disabilities or public servants. But his much more sweeping attempt to do so was, of course, shot down by the Supreme Court, who said that he was overreaching in terms of his executive power. He's outlined a number of other policy proposals as well, including in the budget he just sent to Congress last month. But of course, congressional approval would be uh, required for a lot of that to become reality. And we know that's not all too likely in today's yeah. Washington. Uh, yeah, certainly not, uh, Kelly. all over this. And of course, you got a lot of work uh, to do over the next uh, 24, 48 hours with some of those big primaries uh, coming in in several uh, key states. Kelly Lyons, the co-host of Balance of Power. You can check her out at 5 p.m. every day right here on Bloomberg Television. And when we come back after the break, we're going to set you up for what to watch, including a key ballot measure in one of those primaries tomorrow. That's coming up after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Some breaking news in the IPO market. We're now learning that cloud data software company Rubrik plans to seek a listing on the New York Stock Exchange as soon as this month. Rubrik backed by Microsoft, which took a big stake in the company back in 2021. 
and something to keep an eye on here now as we finally start to see that IPO pipeline start to open up. Yeah, thank you, Estera Labs. Thank you, Reddit, right, for Microsoft's uh, rubric to continue uh, seeking a listing. All right, let's look ahead to tomorrow because voters in Kansas City will decide whether to approve a sales tax that will raise as much as $2 billion for two sports stadiums. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Maxwell Adler. So, Max, we know that um, Kansas City is a big sports town, but the polling on this sales tax is really, really tight. It's not clear whether this will pass. Yeah, right now, as you said, polling is really tight. Um, it seems to be a jump ball right now. Um, we do know that turnout tends to skew conservative in off-cycle elections where uh, more spending-averse voters are going to come to the polls. Um, but there is a lot of public support for this. Um, the Kansas City mayor, Quentin Lucas, has come out in support of this. And the Chiefs and the Royals have been participating in a bit of a media blitz, airing a bunch of commercials urging voters to approve this. Um, so we will wait to see what happens tomorrow. But right now, it's really tight. It's really tight. And I'm kind of curious that this even went to an actual ballot referendum here. If it does fail, then what options are out there other than maybe the billionaire owners of the team coming up with the money themselves? So if the vote fails, you can expect both teams to start flirting with other cities. It seems like the smart business move to get other cities into the competition um, and start getting them to compete against each other so that the team could extract the best public financing package that they possibly could get. Um, but it's very unlikely that there's a sizable and wealthy enough city that was willing to build a modern stadium primarily with public financing under good lease terms for either of these teams. So it's pretty unlikely that they would successfully um, relocate to another city. Um, but do you do expect them to be flirting with some other cities to try to extract some more public money out of Kansas City? Yeah, that's usually the playbook, threaten to leave the city. Part of the playbook also is for the sports owners, team owners, to say how this will be a good thing for the city. It'll generate a lot of jobs. But in general, the tide has kind of turned um, among the public to kind of support these big projects. What, what have we seen lately that lends concern to this idea that they, they can get this done? So typically when these um, ballot measures are brought to the public, they only pass about 50% of the time. And recently in Tempe, Arizona, um, there was a referendum to uh, create a public financing package for the Arizona Coyotes to build a new stadium, and that vote ended up failing. Um, and in 2016, um, in San Diego, there was another ballot measure that failed to build a new stadium for uh, the San Diego Chargers at the time, who did end up moving to Los Angeles. Um, so. It's not a shoe in that this is going to pass. Yeah. And even in a sports city like Kansas City, um, you could expect that a lot of people yeah. have some spending fatigue related to sports stadium finance. All right, Maxwell Adler there, uh, keep an eye on this uh, big vote uh, scheduled to happen uh, tomorrow, April 2nd, as we set you up for what to watch in financial markets over the next 24 hours. We do get some economic data as the drumbeat to the Friday jobs report starts now. Yeah, the job opening uh, uh, layoffs and turnover survey comes out. And of course, we also get factory orders and durable goods, which takes on extra importance because of today's ISM manufacturing numbers. We also get a lot of Fed speak here from people like Loretta Mesker as well as Michelle Bowman. And we get a new Fed president this over at the St. Louis Fed. Yeah, he replaces James Bullard. And of course, their voting continues. Uh, primary day in Connecticut, in Delaware, in New York. Did you register? Who do you got? All right. So <laughs> we'll have full coverage of all that tomorrow. Join us then. We'll be back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.